Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. I just want to make sure that you can hear me clearly. All right. I think that's thumbs up. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fifth uh, webinar in the Islands Trust Conservancy Speaker Series. My name is Wendy Tyrrell, and I work as a Species at Risk Program Coordinator for the Islands Trust Conservancy. And uh, I'm excited today to host the webinar with our guest speaker, Katrina Stipek, who is representing the BC Conservation Data Center um, with a presentation on the CDC 101 providing information about biodiversity in BC. So I'm really grateful to Katrina for presenting for us today and for each of you for taking the time to join us in learning more about species at risk in our region. Um, I'd like to start our meeting off with a First Nations uh, land and water acknowledgement. And if you're inspired to do so, please feel free to add your own personal acknowledgement in the chat room. So with, with respect, I would like to acknowledge that we're gathered here from our homes and workplaces across the lands and waters of the Coast Salish peoples and possibly from outside of this area. And in acknowledging First Peoples of this place and their longstanding relationship of respect, stewardship, and reciprocity with plants, animals, land, water, each other, I'm humbled and, and inspired by the work that uh, we all are doing and reminded that uh, we can play a positive role in restoring these cultural, spiritual connections to the land and for people that we work with uh, by protecting, restoring, and learning more about the land itself. And I think this is key to uh, moving forward in a good way. Thanks for giving space uh, for acknowledging these impacts. Um, of colonialization past and current. And I'd like to now go over a quick agenda. Um, first, we're gonna do some housekeeping notes, um, and then I will do a brief introduction into the Islands Trust Conservancy and the SARP program. Uh, I will then do presentation intro, and uh, Katrina will take over from there on her presentation. After the presentation, we'll have a Q&A and a um, q and after the Q&A, Katrina is going to carry on with a demo for the programs that she's going to be speaking about. And we should have you out of here by 2.30. OK, so next we're going to go to those housekeeping notes. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so um, we ask that you please stay muted during the duration of the presentation. But we do encourage you to turn your cameras on. It's very nice for the speaker to be able to see faces. Um, so if you feel comfortable with that while being recorded, please do. And then also, please feel free to use the chat box uh, to ask questions. And speaking of that chat box, um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Corlin Strachan. Say hi, Corlin. There she is. Hello, everyone. I'll be in the background helping with the questions. <laughs> Right. She, Corlin is the go-to person today for technical issues you might have, like I can't find my mute button or why can't I see the presenter, those kinds of things. You can find her directly in the chat through the drop down, or you can just put your question right into the, um, into the chat box there. Okay. There's that. So today's presentation, as I said, is the fifth in a series of webinars that we are hosting that focus on species and ecosystems at risk in our region. And over the past 31 years, together with local conservancies, landholders, community members, and others, the ITC, or Islands Trust Conservancy, has helped to protect special places here in the islands by encouraging, undertaking, and assisting in voluntary conservation initiatives. We also now have a species at risk program that was launched in the summer of 2020. And this is our program along with work that we're doing with species at risk, like the speaker series here, SAR surveys and habitat enhancement. These are all made possible by the funding that we were awarded to us by Environment and Climate Change Canada through their um, Priority Places funding stream. So we're really happy to announce that we did uh, get extended for an additional three years of funding. So that's exciting. Um, if you want to learn more about the Conservancy and our SAR program, you can check out the website. I've put a link there. So with that, I'd like to get started and introduce you to Katrina. So I'm really happy that uh, Katrina was able to speak with us today. Uh, 
as one of the high priorities that came out for learning uh, when we did a uh, feedback survey in last year during a SAR workshop was that collecting, submitting, and analyzing data and understanding and having access to data is key to uh, the current status and knowing how to manage this uh, species at risk in our region. So Katrina is coming to us from the BC Conservation Data Center with the Ministry of Water, Land, and Resource Stewardship. She completed her um, BS uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Geography from the University of Victoria, has worked with nonprofit organizations, regional and federal governments, before joining the CDC's management unit in 2005. She's been there quite a long time. And as the Species and Ecosystems Risk Information Specialist, she notes that she has a passion for client service and is really happy to help with any of your CDC data needs. So now, Katrina, I'm going to send it over to you. I will start sharing my screen. Oh. I don't think you were sharing, but you did, as far as I know, but you did a fine job. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry okay. about that. Was not sharing my screen. Feel free to share yours. We can see all the lovely faces, so it's all good. That's good. And I am going to start sharing mine and share and I think you can all see that let me know if that's not right yeah are we good thumbs up okay start this off then and we'll close that okay so thank you so much um, I'm, let me just fiddle with my screen for a moment to make sure that I can see everything I need to see. Okay. Thank you, Wendy, and uh, for that introduction and to Islands Trust for asking me to present today. And of course, thanks to all of you for your interest in attending and learning more about the VC Conservation Data Center and what we can provide to you. Um, so uh, I think, I, I think as Wendy said, um, or if you do have questions, I'm just going to say that uh, you're welcome to put them in the chat and, and uh, Corlin, thank you for looking at that, monitor, monitoring that along with Wendy. Um, I'm happy to answer questions as they come up or if they make more sense to address at the end, uh, we'll do so that way too and I can let you know. So I, I thank you so much for doing um, that introduction. Um, Wendy and the acknowledgement. And I just also want to acknowledge that the CDC does carry out its work on traditional territories of many, many Indigenous nations throughout BC. Um, I personally am presenting today from my home in the uh, unceded territories of the Wasanich peoples and here in Brentwood Bay, close to the Sartlip community. Um, and I'm so very grateful to be here. Um, part of my own interest took me to learning more about a local park that I go to very often and um, to keep my mind and body healthy and happy. And that's uh, what I've been practicing is how to um, pronounce it with the um, this traditional name, uh, Klevelnuk. I think that I'm doing it not too badly. Um, Klevelnuk Dean Park. Um, and I learned that the meaning of this Senchothan word is a place of refuge or healing. And um, there's a really interesting story behind that name, um, significant to the Wasanich Nation. And I encourage you to look that up if it's of interest to you. But regardless, I can certainly agree that Klevelnuk is a healing place for me. So thank you and welcome. Oh, and of course, the shot of my dog Earl and me enjoying Klevelnuk. So on to what we're here for today to learn about. Um, things I'll be covering today, the background of the CDC, our core functions, um, why we do what we do. Uh, we'll talk about those core functions of BC conservation status ranks, element occurrences, other CDC spatial products that uh, are in the, in the works right now. We'll talk about data submissions and um, of course, how you can access uh, the data that we can provide to you. I will um, have a quick uh, slides of a tool overview in case you can't stick around for the demos. Um, after that will be the question and answers, and then um, I'll launch into actually showing you live demos of how those tools work so that you can use them in uh, for your interest. So, excuse me. The CDC is housed in the BC government. 
uh, currently within the Ministry of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Uh, we've been bounced around a bit, but that's where we are right now in Walrus um, in the knowledge management branch. We have a bit of an interesting history though at the CBC. Um, we were officially created in 1990. There was an information gap, um, realization that before you can conserve and protect what we have in the province, we first need to know what there is in the province and subsequently how those plants and animals are doing. Uh, the result of um, that recognition was an agreement between the BC government, um, Ministry of Environment at the time, I believe, and a number of nonprofit organizations. Um, interestingly, which I didn't even know, the, um, the Nature Conservancy of Canada had a supervising role uh, at the start of the program. Um, and the BC government was to kind of provide uh, the space for that. As time has gone on now, BC government has taken over that full responsibility many years ago. Um, but it's important to point out that we are also unique in that the, the BC Conservation Data Center is purposely kept arm's length from policy and management in the government. Um, it makes our role a bit uh, very defined and easier in many respects. Um, it's, our, our job is to provide foundational data and information based on science to allow others, both internal and external to government, make informed decisions that affect um, conservation and biodiversity. And a very significant part of our work and identity at the CDC is our membership and close ties with NatureServe and NatureServe Canada. They're a global and a national nonprofit organization. Each province and territory and state um, has an equivalent conservation data center that's a member of the NatureServe network. Uh, and NatureServe Canada, of course, has representation across Canada, um, including associate membership from Parks Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And um, NatureServe Canada facilitates national scale projects. Uh, they provide a, like a Canadian voice to the NatureServe network and help maintain those strong partnerships between the individual CDCs uh, with each other and the federal organizations as well. So the NatureServe network has over 60 um, CDC equivalent programs in total. Um, together, we provide science-based data to support conservation. And we use a, like a common method for how we assess and how we map species and ecological communities at risk um, you know, across this North American area. Uh, we use a cloud-based platform and that allows us to efficiently integrate and share data between those organizations. So we can send data to the global um, cloud environment and we can grab that global data and incorporate it into our own uh, database um, as well. And NatureServe can integrate all that spatial and tabular data from the different CDC programs and manage that um, for national scale projects and global scale projects. So it's, it's, it's pretty neat. And the results of that collective knowledge and expertise um, really helps support us in our roles uh, and also provides those opportunities for cross-border analysis and, and really cool projects like, um, like national scale, national range projects that we're doing across Canada and species distribution modeling. Um, so it, it also helps clients who are doing massive projects like pipelines that cross those jurisdictional boundaries to be able to go to one spot and get the information from all the different programs. So serves a lot of functions um, and it's a big part of, of who we are at the CDC. Who, we, who are we in BC? Uh, we are generally a staff of 10 to 12. Um, we've ha had some kind of significant retirements recently, but that's also coming with some, some exciting uh, hiring. So that's great. Uh, we have a number of units. We have the ecology unit, botany, zoology, data management, which I am part of, and we don't get a pretty picture. We get a map, but the reason we're here, I guess, well, <laughs> that's the data that results from all the fun stuff. And then we have our acting manager, um, and I've given her um, a hoary marmot, not a species at risk, but she loves rodents, so there we go. We're also, you know, there's 10 to 12 of us. It's not a huge team, 
Uh, but we are really lucky to have, um, well, lucky, and we strategize by training up quite a number of uh, contractors that are so important to our work, because as we have funding and capacity, uh, we can pull on some of those, um, those contractors that have that, that knowledge of our methods and can, can help uh, boost our data by providing more mapping and um, more of the things I'm going to talk about to come. So we're really, um, we benefit greatly from our contractors as well. So I'm going to start with uh, why we do what we do at the CDC. Now these are, look kind of random, these photos. They do all have something in common. I, my guess is you won't figure out what that thing is, uh, but uh, if anyone's putting anything in the chat, let me know. Um, these are like Googled image, like image comments. So don't get, get a sidetracked by the cute dog or anything. They're kind of just like the result of looking for a park bench and a playground. Um, but I'll put you out of your misery. Uh, they're all reflecting a bit of bad news, which is that at this time, Nettles quillwort, which is now yellow listed, but was a species at risk considered at the time. Uh, unfortunately, all of these things uh, destroyed a location of Nettles quillwort. Um, so a park bench was put over one. <laughs> We've got a commemorative plaque put over another and a playground um, directly on top of, of that plant. It, what I'm trying to say here is that this is what happened unintentionally when data either isn't available to everybody to use or it's not used to make those, those decisions and be informed in those decisions. So, you know, if they had known that there were these plants there, um, plans would have probably changed, been mitigated, whatever that would look like, but clearly it would have minimized some of this damage. I don't think the park bench had to go there. So let's go on to a good news story. So in this case, we had a, an introduced snail in Vesuvius, uh, Salt Spring Island, and it required management control. They wanted to get rid of the snail. Um, in reviewing the data, it was um, it discovered that there was sharp-tailed snake in the area. Uh, the food source of sharp-tailed snake includes native snails. So the decision was made not to use, the use a molluscicide treatment that would not only have um, eradicate the introduced snail, but also native snails that would have had a negative effect on the snakes in the area. So this is an example of why we want information out there and used. So what do we do? We have some core functions at the CDC. We have a lot of other projects on the go, but this is what we have to do. And this is, this is our, our focus and our bread and butter. Um, and I'll speak about each of these in a bit more detail on the following slides as well. So the first is that we compile and report out what species in ecological communities, which we call elements, uh, it's a nature search term, what exists in the province. Second, we determine the risk of extirpation by conducting a conservation status assessment to assign a conservation status rank. The rank reflects how at risk an element is of extirpation from BC. So I should say extirpation meaning its risk of being lost from the province. We then map the, the known locations or the locations of those elements determined to be at risk. And our standard mapping unit is an element occurrence or EO, which I'll be talking about. Um, and it's a, again, a nature search standard um, map unit. We're also currently working on other data products that I'll talk about as well. And then finally, and super importantly, we make that data and information accessible through our online tools. So I talked about elements and we use the term element um, Apart from me getting tired of saying species and ecological communities every time, uh, it's, a, it's a recognized taxa of a plant, animal, or ecological community, which is the unit we track in the province. So in some cases, we're tracking um, a species. In some, in some places, we're tracking subspecies or population or variety. So it allows us to, to, to talk about elements that maybe represent different taxa in, in the province. The, the lists of what we, um, or the list of elements and that information about what occurs in BC is accessible through BC Species and Ecosystems Explorer. So currently um, we report out vertebrates 
invertebrates, vascular plants, bryophytes, um, lichens, and I'll just say that that is my drawing of the lichen that was chosen to be represented in our tool. When we Googled for, um, you know, common images of lichens, they're apparently it's not that popular, so I had fun doing that. It's my claim to fame. Macrofungi and ecological communities. Um, currently, there's over da -da -da, how many elements reported through Species and Ecosystems Explore? Oh, I was going to say at the beginning. I may have put a few questions to you, and but I haven't set up any polls. My bad. So uh, can everyone use the thumbs up? I'm going to say if you can find the reaction thumbs up or something like that. Are there five thousand? Anybody? Ten thousand? Fifteen thousand? You're all just looking for a thumbs up, right? I'm just going to say there are 24,000 currently reported and exported out through BC Species and Ecosystems Explorer, or I'll say BCSEE. Uh, remember, there are 12 staff at the CDC. Um, so we do have other sources of information we use to maintain these lists, and those come from NatureServe and um, Canada's National General Status Program. We add to this number regularly. Um, some of the groups coming this year, I believe, will be adding tardigrades. And if you don't know what a tardigrade is, I'm positive you're not alone, but you should look it up because they're very, very cute little microscopic things. Um, slime molds, I believe, might be added this year. And I thought lice, but I looked that up today, and I think it's already going out in our um, in our tools. So. If you're at the edge of your seat and wondering how many slime molds there are in the province, I recommend you reach out to um, my email, which I meant to also post in the chat, my apologies. Um, and every, every year we send out an announcement about what's new been added to the database and anything else interesting that we've done throughout the year. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. So now we have the list, what occurs in the province. Now we need to look at those closely and determine what their conservation status rank is using this assessment. So the NatureServe method is used for conducting status assessments and it's available online, you can look it up. Some of the key features to that methodology is that it's transparent, it's repeatable and it's science-based. Um, the, the method by NatureServe applies to both species and ecological communities and Interestingly, it can be applied at any geographic scale. So you can use the same calculator uh, included in this, um, in this document or at the same website. And you can assess globally, nationally, provincially, or you can apply that even to your own community or backyard. Um, so it'll, the, the calculator allows you to make use of what information you have available, um, even if it's limited, and it'll be reflected in the rank. So what kind of information goes into um, this uh, assessment process? We look at rarity, threats, and trends. So under rarity, we uh, consider range extent. So the, the continuous boundary within the province that encompasses all those occurrences, those known occurrences of a, of a species or ecosystem at risk. We look at area of occupancy. So within that range, how much is actually known to be occupied by that element? We look at population size, uh, the number of occurrences, and the number of occurrences with good viability or ecological integrity. And what that means is that we place special value on those locations that are protected to some degree. So something that's located or a location within a national park, for example, is likely to persist there and be more protected than one on the side of the highway. So that's considered in ranking as well. Environmental specificity. So for example, uh, specialists that have you know, very specific environmental requirements that's considered. And then threats are assessed using um, an International Union for the Conservation of Nature or IUCN Threats Calculator. There's a lot of information that goes into a threats calculator. Um, dozens of different uh, things are considered um, from transportation, human interaction. Um, oh gosh, there's just so many. Uh, and all of that is rolled up to provide a threat score, which is then 
plugged into the conservation status uh, calculators. Um, a lot of experts sit around a table and determine what those threats are. So uh, uh, I should mention that uh, the, this process of conservation status ranking does include, um, again, we have a limited staff and limited expert, you know, expertise in different things. So we will we'll pull from experts across the province um, within and outside of government to help uh, inform this kind of process. Um, we look at intrinsic vulnerabilities. So when a, a, a natural characteristic of that species makes it especially vulnerable to additional stress. So um, white sturgeon, for example, don't spawn until up to 34 years of age. So that's something that's just inherently um, vulnerable to that species. And we look at short and long-term trends as well. Uh, and all of this information is, is factored in, it's weighted, there's an algorithm which results in a rank at the other side. That rank is always reviewed by experts and accepted as the final assigned status rank. The result being the BC Conservation Status Rank, uh, represented by these numbers of one to five. So we've got um, the S here stands for subnational, uh, which is in, uh, that every conservation data center in each jurisdiction assigns its own subnational rank for a, um, an element. So in our case, of course, that's in BC. Uh, and that, that scoring from one to five, uh, we see there's S1 meaning, meaning critically imperiled, so the most at risk. We've got a Southern maiden hair fern there representing that. We've got an imperiled white sturgeon, a canyon wren that has a rank of S3 question mark, which I'll talk about, which means it's vulnerable, and uh, apparently secure western toad, and then we've got an Engelman spruce there for an S5 or secure in the province. Um, there are other ranks. Uh, we've got range ranks or uncertainty. So that question mark next to the S3 of the canyon wren is reflecting uncertainty around what the actual rank is. Uh, when you, the, the calculator, or the, um, the conservation status assessment process takes into account data that we don't have, data that is uncertain and um, can result in either these uncertainty ranks or range ranks. You could potentially have an S1, S3 for one element, meaning that we it's somewhere within there and we don't know. There's more information on our website about that. Um, there's also, you'll find, there's a number of other ranks, but one of the ones you'll see quite a lot in our data is SNR, and that means not yet ranked. And that generally you'll find in some of the new groups of species that come online each year. So we know there are these lice occurring in BC, but we don't either A, have the expertise or the information at this time to have um, assigned a conservation status rank to that yet. Uh, so those are our wish lists and the ones we want to get to but have not gotten to yet. And in addition, the uh, NatureServe will use the same process, uh, collecting data across you know, North America to assign a G rank or global rank. And um, and NatureServe Canada will do the same uh, and produce a national or N rank. So each element, like a Southern maiden hair fern, could have would have an S rank, an N rank, and a G rank. So a lot of our users are more familiar with the BC red, blue, and yellow list. And there, um, I always like to clear up any confusion around this in that the red, blue, and yellow lists are simplified grouping of the conservation status ranks. They are not a regulatory list. They are to help um, prioritize where, uh, what, could be, um, what could be eligible for legal designation or to help prioritize conservation action, but on their own, they are not actually legal lists. Um, they, they're really in an effort to simplify the, the more information rich conservation status ranks. Because it is, you know, seeing a whole bunch of numbers and range ranks and uncertainty, they can be complex to interpret and to search on. Um, so we've grouped them into red, blue, and yellow. 
there is, uh, when we say in BC or the CDC species at risk, we generally are referring to those that are red or blue, red or blue listed. And currently there's around approximately 2000 in BC that fall on the red or blue list at this time. So another of our core functions is to map the locations of those species or ecological communities that we determine to be at risk. Um, one of our main product is the element occurrence, which again is a standard nature serve unit. And an element occurrence represents the following. Katrina, so yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, nope. We did have a question you might want to address while you are on that previous slide. Um, Amy asks, uh, are they not considered regulatory because BC has no endangered species ask legislation? Is that the reason why they're not considered regulatory? Um, I would say that they're not necessarily connected. Uh, the BC red and blue list came came into effect many, many years ago. I think before before legislation was was being, you know, part of the uh, the current um, conversations. So it really was not supposed to be uh, related to um, legislation at the time. Um, having said that, there are legislations that, that pull from the BC red, blue, and yellow list. So I think, and, and I wasn't here when it started, and we actually still have conversations about the best way forward with our, with our BC red and blue and yellow lists. But what it was is that um, I, I believe that under the Forest and Range Practices Act, for example, they looked to, to our red list to determine what might be eligible to be put under that legislation. So it was, I think, more of a way of prioritizing uh, and simplifying to see what might be eligible to be, uh, you know, after all of those other considerations are made, what may be put on the uh, regulatory list. I hope that thank, answers. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. So element occurrences, and yes, do feel free to interrupt me. I don't, yeah, I'm happy to pause in case there's questions as well. Um, <clears throat> so an element occurrence documents where a species or ecological community is or was present. And I say or was because historical presence is still important. We, we do wanna know what did support, you know, or what areas did support locations of um, elements at risk, even if they don't anymore. We don't remove it from our system if uh, just because it's no longer there. Um, so it's a vetted observation. Uh, there is a difference between an observation and an element occurrence. So we will look to observation data and we will ask, um, is it reliable? So that's the vetted part of it. Is it a reliable ob observation? Um, does it have practical conservation value? So given uh, pot potential for continued or historic presence or regular occurrence at a given location, and that it sustains the survival of that species or ecological community. Um, so examples here would be, um, we wouldn't map a bird sitting in a tree necessarily, good observation, super, totally valid, but, um, we don't, we want it to be an area of land that you can manage for. And uh, if we saw, if we had an observation of a bird in a tree, likely it wouldn't be mapped as an occurrence. However, over time, seeing that same thing occurring there may make it eligible for an element occurrence. A nest in a tree certainly is an area or a location that you can make management decisions around. And so that would be mapped as an element occurrence. Um, a snake den would be mapped as an element occurrence. But a snake, you know, crossing crossing a footpath likely would not. Um, there's always nuances to that, but uh, but that's the general idea behind that. An element occurrence represents a population based on dispersal and breeding. So uh, we look to nature serve to help guide uh, our mapping, and there is um, recommended separation distances that determines whether two separate locations would be considered one population or two populations. And we look at things like suitable or unsuitable habitat um, that are considered in determining what that distance is as well. So one element occurrence can be made up of many locations that are 
separate. And element occurrence is always what we know, not what we assume or suspect. So um, if we saw a, a moth on a host plant, we would map the location of that moth. Even if that plant, you know, it continues on through a field, we wouldn't necessarily map that field. We would map the location of where we know that, map, that moth occurred. EOs are always mapped as polygons. That polygon, contrary to some uh, misconceptions, is not hiding or obscuring the location of a species or ecosystem at risk. The polygon is there to reflect the locational uncertainty associated with the source data. So what you'll find is that um, uh, collection or observations that have been collected using um, high-end GPSs that we've recent, you know, received in the last number of years will have very small buffers around them because the uncertainty associated with those may be 15 meters. I mean, we, we never know exactly where something is um, to reflect on a map. The older, uh, there's standards, so, but some of the older observations we have will have a larger buffer around them because it's based on coordinates that have been provided to, um, you know, maybe not to as fine a scale as we would like. So the, the point of the, of the polygon is to ensure we capture the actual location so that you can manage for it. Um, we want to make sure that we don't lose that by just submitting and giving a point. Having said that, the underlying data are available and we can have conversations if that's something, you know, a, a data standard that helps you in your work, but, you know, we don't like to recommend that for management decisions at all. And then, as said, we look to NatureServe to provide guidance for determining what, what is an element occurrence for a species. Um, so that's where we get our guidance. I just wanted to do a quick, quick walk, walk through of an example for an EO for red-legged frog. So we might start by mapping a point, a line, or a polygon. Perhaps it's a single point observation, or perhaps it was observed along a stretch of stream, um, in which case we're mapping a stream or a lake. Whatever that beginning source data is, we apply that uncertainty buffer so that we ensure we capture the actual location. Um, and then, so here I'm gonna show you an example. We end up with that source feature, sorry, at the end. So all of our source features are polygons. Now we're looking at all of these uh, locations of the Northern Red-Legged Frog. We have um, one polygon um, source feature here or um, initial visit, I should say. Uh, and, but we've got a greater than five kilometer separation between these other um, source features. Because of the guidelines that NatureServe has provided us with, these are determined to be two separate element occurrences. One has only one source feature associated with it. The one um, to the southeast has 11 separate source features associated with it. I'm happy to talk about that more. You can always reach out to me. So element occurrence data sources. So we've seen how we map an element occurrence, uh, but where does the data come from? As you know, there's only a few staff of us and you know our staff really like to get it into the field and conduct field work, keep up our skills, but data generally do come from other sources. Uh, we've got within the government, we look to, um, within our same branch, knowledge management branch, there are people that manage the observation data sets in the province and the, the reports. So they deal with all the submissions that come in to the province and the CDC pulls those that are relevant to us. So we look to EcoCAT reports, uh, survey data, telemetry data, incidental observations, fish observations, different ecosystem mapping products. So terrestrial ecosystem mapping and predictive ecosystem mapping and sensitive ecosystems inventories. Uh, external though, we're not tied to just getting um, internal government. We can go out and look for other data sources. So we look to um, COSIWIC reports, which is the, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And so that's a national organization um, who does reporting. Uh, we look to recovery and management plan reports, uh, museum specimens, museum records, and 
more and more we're looking at citizen science and how we can use that information to inform our mapping. Um, it's still, we're still figuring out how to navigate that, those, uh, those massive data sets, but um, yeah, but they're proving to be more and more valuable. So some of those include eFauna or eFlora, iNaturalist, which many of you may be um, familiar with, eBird and GBIF, which is Global Biodiversity. I can't remember the rest of that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we also do get data submissions coming directly to the CDC, and so we can incorporate those as well. Although we always encourage going to the provincial data repository so it's available to everybody. So the next thing we do, as said, is it a reliable observation? Like, does it make sense or is it way out of its range? In which case we'd want to do some follow up with whoever observed that. Uh, we'd want to just ensure that it's, it is what it is. I mean, some species are just not easy to identify. Um, we ask that question, does it have practical conservation value? And then we do have minimum data requirements that need to be met. We want to know who observed it, uh, when they observed it, uh, then of course the species name and where, where it occurred. So those are very minimal of what we need to map. And then if all of that information is, or we have all that information and uh, that criteria are met, we can map that as an element occurrence. And if we have enough information, ideally we would be able to apply an element occurrence rank, which is separate from a conservation status rank that's at the element level, the EO rank is applied at the element occurrence level and says how well it's doing at that location, which in turn feeds back into um, whether it's viable, whether it has high ecological integrity, and that's again considered into um, the conservation status rank. So how can you find the CDC element occurrence data online? Um, I'll show you in the demos, but through our online tools, you can find the following public spatial layers. So publicly, we have uh, the first one, publicly available occurrences. That's 90% of our data that are publicly available. We have separated out the extirpated and historical ones, basically in an effort not to hide our, um, or like not hide, but obscure some of our more finely mapped occurrences with those kind of larger historical ones that sometimes obliterate an area. So there, but it's still important data to have because many times, you know, the province is vast. We have not gone back to particular locations necessarily. So we just don't have confirmation that it's still there, but quite possibly in some areas it is. Um, and then we have mass secured. So that is a representation that you can see of where we have secured or restricted data, CDC data, and I'll talk a bit about that. <clears throat> Our restricted layers include, uh, I'll talk about these, but uh, species that are susceptible to harm or persecution and data that are considered to be proprietary. And you can find these to the BC Data Catalog and the IMAP applications, including CDC IMAP and Habitat Wizard. So a bit of, I'm going to move into a bit about data security, and um, part of that is to give you the background that in, in 2011, the province of BC introduced the open information and open data policy. This was great because by default, um, you know, CDC has allowed its data to be open. And so we aligned really well with this already. Um, the, the thought being that government data should be accessible and available. Um, and to restrict that data requires a strong rationale. Um, we've always, along with the NatureServe network, been a huge proponent of accessible data. So this was, this was great. Um, and the, we believe the protection and recovery of species and ecosystems is dependent on access to that best available data and information. And knowledge is power, and the more that we share, the better. Uh, having said that, there are reasons that we restrict access to some data and I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. So categories of secure data. We have uh, intention, uh, species susceptible to persecution or harm. And this basically covers uh, where a, a species is at risk of intentional persecution um, or illegal collection 
or unintentional harassment. So Western rattlesnake, where people, there are people that don't like snakes and can destroy hundreds of individuals if they, uh, if they know where a den is. Uh, illegal collection, we've got a peregrine falcon here. Um, so fal falconers could collect the eggs or the young for falconry. And unintentional harassment could be sharp-tailed grouse lex, where um, it's really interesting for people to go and see the dancing grounds, but can um, unintentionally disturb them. The other reason is that data and information are proprietary. So this includes um, data collected on private land, where the private landowner has requested it not be released publicly, or the, or the data owner who submits the data uh, wants it to be restricted for a time limit, for example. But we wanna make sure that we're transparent about where secure data is because we need it to be available to those that require the information to make informed decisions. So if you're conducting a project in an area, we need for you to be able to see that you're not seeing everything and we need you to reach out to us uh, to determine whether that species is best served for you to know it's there. So you can see that you would see this big gray mask that tells you to reach out to us. Uh, we need to know what activities are happening or um, why you need the data in your particular project area. So please do reach out. And through X Species and Ecosystems Explorer, you would see that lock saying that that element has some secured or restricted locations. So, uh, this data is not inaccessible. It is accessible to those who need it. So um, I just like to say that we're not, we're not restricting it from everybody, but we're restricting it from public access. So again, you just need to reach out to us with information and details of why you need that data. If you do, if we determine you need that data, you need to complete data security training and a confidentiality and non-reproduction agreement. And uh, that will be in place for three years for you. However, every time you return a need or a request new secure data, we do this screening on every request. Oh, yeah. Um, so other spatial data products we're working on. So we've talked about documented, which is our element occurrences, but we're looking at the potential, which is range data. So within the general area where a species or community, ecological community is expected to occur, within suitable habitat. Um, we're using eco-section line work for this as our data standard. Most species and ecological communities have a draft and a uh, draft range map. They're undergoing review at this time though. So uh, once those reviews are completed, that data will be accessible for download and public viewing um, this year. And then we're also looking at, we're at the very beginning stages of species, species habitat models or SHM. So it's a, it's a new project. Um, we're starting out with focusing on potential methods and inputs into that data, but this will help again refine within that range where that species or community is likely to be found. So that's really exciting multi-year project. I'd like to highlight this slide just to show you kind of, I'm not going to read out all of the uses and users, but what, the, what we're telling you here is um, to support all of these uses and users, the more data and the more robust and complete our information is, the better we can meet all of these needs. Um, you know, when it, most of our data is publicly accessible, but we, we respond to about 900 re custom requests for data every year to help support all of these needs. So um, all to say, we do want to use your data. Um, how to submit your data? We like to root it again through the, um, the BC uh, data re government data repository because submitting to the province is, is truly submitting to an open data um, repository since we have an open data policy. Uh, from this website, uh, you can find standards and data collection templates and experts to help you at spymail at gov.bc.ca. So they will, they can help you um, in your submission process. Now, we do need that minimum of information of who, what, where, and when, so keep that in mind. Um, if you're submitting incidental observations, uh, unfortunately, the website, the government website for that is not functioning. They'll route you to submit using an Excel spreadsheet, which is great. And if you need help, contact spymail. Having said that, I do understand that incidental observations can be uh, 
you know, a little challenging to, to submit. So I'm sure you're all aware, but iNaturalist is a super fun, uh, you can lose yourself in it forever. And you can see here, this is just a screenshot. There's 22,000 observations just on Salt Spring Island alone. Um, so you can use this. The CDC does look to this as a data, um, you know, as one of our data sources. So I would recommend having a look because it's super fun. Please make sure you use inaturalist.ca and not .org um, because we can actually get access to data much more easily through .ca. And, uh, and if you are on the fence about obscuring or letting it be public, everything's easier for us if you allow it to be public. But um, if you do obscure it, we actually can reach out to you to see what we can do with it. So um, keep that in mind as well. In a nutshell, quick overview of our tools on the next few slides, and then I think where we've got questions. But the CDC can tell you what's in BC, how is it doing, where is it potentially found, where is it known to be found, and how is it doing at that location? How? Through our tools. So BC Species and Ecosystems Explore, what do we use this for? You can search by a species or ecological community name and get information. You can generate lists based on conservation status, BC Red Blue Yellow list or legal designation like Species at Risk Act or SERA or the Forest Range Practices Act. Um, you can generate lists by species group or community group. You can search by area and get results of what potentially might be found in your area. Not necessarily known to occur, but potentially in suitable habitat. And that's based on our underlying range maps that are still undergoing review, so you will find a bit of uh, some, some strange results sometimes. If you do see strange results, come back to us and we can help uh, kind of navigate that. You can find best management practices, um, view uh, reports, and export those reports to Excel and PDF. You can also see an overview of mapped known locations. Oh, and in Islands Trust, I found there are 350 potential elements at risk. CDC IMAP spatial application, view element occurrences in your area, search for element occurrences for one particular element. You can view detailed reports, look for secure data, see if there's anything you need to reach out to us for. You can export those results to Shapefile or Excel or CSV. And you can add in additional data layers. Um, a quick search of Islands Trust, there's 541 mapped element occurrences in the area. BC Catalog, this is not a CDC product, but I like to show it because this is where you can search for any data sets you're looking for in the province, view the metadata, and really importantly, find the point of contact, the, in, the person you can ask more questions of of that data layer. EcoAtlas is a product coming very soon. It's sitting in delivery right now. I just need to get it into production. Um, and it is bringing together the best of Habitat Wizard, if you're familiar with that, and CDC IMAP bringing those together and um, with a lot of preloaded layers and some, some improved tools that I think will be really great for our users. Um, basically, instead of just searching CDC data, it will be giving you results for the, um, the observation data as well um, and other data sets uh, that are kind of significant and often used when people are considering, uh, you know, what is gonna be affected on the landscape. Um, so definitely keep your eye out for that. It'll be coming really soon. Oh, and this is um, Mount Warburton Pike, in case you didn't know. This is the place I'm most familiar with <laughs> in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Islands Trust area. That is my husband, not a species at risk. Um, I will quickly move on though to show you what we didn't know we were, the area that we were in, like that was probably 30 years ago. Um, so, this is just a little snapshot of my own interest seeing what was actually mapped in that area when we were so wonderfully um, just hanging out there. And um, this is a starwort and banded cord moss. And that takes me into questions, and then a demo. So thank you. All right, fantastic. Um, would you be able to, um, maybe stop sharing Katrina I sure can. and I'm actually going to share which will be a first today 
Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yay, yay. All right. Um, thank you, Katrina. That was amazing. So much good information. Um, we have lots of questions. We have some more coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, with, we have a question from Ren. Hey, Ren, nice to see you here. Um, Ren wants to know if uh, what the relationship between the CDC uh, is with SPI EOs at this time. So Katrina answered that oh. actually. Okay. Did she, okay. Did you get an answer? I, I did get an answer, but maybe she has something to add. Um, just so others understand, SPI that you're referring to is like the is species inventory, and that's kind of a word people use for the, the, the database of um, wildlife species inventory. The spatial representation of SPI is wildlife species inventory data layers, and those are the observations. So yeah, so the relationship being that that data encompasses all species in the province, not just those at risk. The CDC mines from those data layers, um, those that are significant to us. Right. Uh, we have a question from Avalon. Um, when submitting to the BC CDC, should you provide point, polygon, or line as collected in the field and note GPS accuracy? And then uh, BC CDC does the buffering for uncertainty, or should you buffer your point, polygon, and line prior to submission? That's a very particular question, but good one. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I, you do not need to buffer for locational uncertainty what we because we have standards we use like standard buffers that are applied but what is um, really useful for us is to know like a lot of times gps's will have a field in it that says what the uncertainty was at the time of collection so that information is really handy um, but for us it's mostly just knowing how it was collected um, and then we kind of apply a standard to that um, in terms of submitting point line or polygon, um, that's a good question. I think when you submit through the, the SPI or WSI portal for the BC government, I think that you, you can provide it in however you collect it. So Any you may upload, I mean, there's probably people here that know much better the answer to that, but we'll use what you provide to us and we'll follow up with you if we have questions. I know we even have mapping contractors attending today yes who are do. probably listening to me thinking they they probably I mean I know they know more than I do but I'll leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm put you can submit in any form because I mean some would be more appropriate to use line and some point and some polygon so yeah. um all right another question from Amy um, I would like to be I would like it to be easier to search by area in Ecosystem Explorer to determine what elements are present. She finds this quite challenging in currently. Yes, I, I, I'm sure you're right because Explorer was never really intended to be a spatial uh, tool. Um, the, that overview map we show as part of the results of an Explorer tool um, was kind of a, a more recent addition so that people could see where in the province something was. When you're talking about a more project or location specific query, at this point, you, you really do need to use CDC IMAP or the spatial layers in another, in another application. Um, but having said that, I, I understand that confusion and we're always you know, trying to improve the tools and we'll probably be there. I think, I think the future will, uh, eventually become a little more integrated that way. But at this point, you do need to go to both, one to get the potential list, one to get the known map locations. That are visible to you. <laughs> yeah. Or that are not, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, question from Mary Beth. How is it resolved when a species is common throughout North America, but is S2 or at risk in BC? In other words, many species are uh, at their northern range in BC. It sounds ominous if they're receiving an insecure uh, in BC, but are obviously not at risk species. Hmm. As yeah, a species. That's, a, that's a good question. And I, I, I think what the biologists probably can answer this in a better way, but 
we really do look at BC when it comes to how at risk something is. So um, you're right, it could be critically imperiled in BC, um, but then secure south of us. So that certainly happens, but I think it allows us to still recognize that you know, we have responsibility in BC for that species and it's at the end of its range. So it's quite, you know, it's more uh, at risk of being lost um, because we've only got a little amount and lost from BC, of course. Uh, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's very common. Um, and if you want a, you know, a more informed answer, I can certainly put you in touch with the uh, biologists that are doing that, this status ranking. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it mostly works in our benefit, though. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Céline. Can you do a demo of oh, this? May You may be doing a demo on how to search for EOs by a particular area. So mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure that's being covered. OK. Um, this is a good question. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've asked myself this question sometimes, but David, uh, is coming back to where you stated the Islands Trust area has 350 potential elements at risk. Um, curious what that includes when he is doing a search for the IT area. Um, he's returning no more than 300 species. Uh, if you include BC list, so he's including red, blue, yellow, extinct. Um, he's getting 299. Anyways, I think the, the question is what criteria you're putting in to get your list. Yeah, and I can, I, I'll show you that when I do the Great. search, but also it's one thing it's important to know, and this is probably something we need to clarify too, is that the area-based searches are limited to um, species at risk, so red and blue, and legally, and or legally designated. So we don't, we have, don't have the capacity to uh, have the information, to fill out the information about yellow listed species in the province in terms of where they occur. It's just not been where we focused our resources. So we've focused um, that filling out that information for red, blue and Sarah listed species and those that are legally designated. So that would be normally I would pick red, blue and then all the legal designations and then do my area search. So if you see a yellow listed species in your search results, probably because it's legally designated or it got switched from um, blue to yellow and we haven't yet kind of removed that from the search. So, yeah. Okay. Um, one more quick question from David is how, how accurate or how, uh, when the word potential is used, um, what is the definition of potential? Yeah, that's, that's a good point to your good question. Um, as I said, currently we're a little bit like, I have to admit, I have some sheepishness around the results we have right now because a lot of those results that you're getting in an area-based search, they're based on the draft ranges we have of species and ecological communities at risk. So what, what we did was we're using eco-sections, which can be quite large scale and broad in areas of the province. Um, we started by bringing in observations, element occurrences, and overlaying that with eco sections. So, if you had an observation overlapping an eco section just barely within it, that whole eco section gets highlighted as the potential range of that species. Um, in some cases, the observation may, maybe it wasn't a super reliable one. That's what our review is, is um, pulling out. So, there's a couple of things. One, if Islands Trust, for example, is only barely inter intersecting an eco section, it may bring in all these species, you know, that are that are considered within that eco section. So there's some nuances around that data. I think when it's publicly available and downloadable, it'll be easier for people to kind of see why they're getting certain results. But if you're seeing results that are um, don't make sense, please let us know. And we just flag that for the expert reviews. And, and those reviews are happening by species specialists that will look at them and say, you know, take that eco section out, that's not right. Um, so they will get better over time in, and they're those reviews are happening now. If you're, if like the definition of potential, I guess what we're saying is that um, the potential within suitable habitat is, 
there for those results once we get them to that reviewed stage. And this is another reason why you go to the map as well um, and, and highlight the area that you're looking for, because that gives you more accurate um, information. Right? It gives you more known information, but there are certainly areas where we don't have a documented element occurrence, but where it's probably known to occur anyway. So that's where the potential helps. Um, uh, I like to, you know, I think they're both important to use, um, but I do understand the limitations right now with our area-based searches, having some species there that you likely won't find uh, just because of this review, undergoing review. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, it's also important to recognize that there's, a, you know, there's 2,000 red and blue listed species in communities, and we have to prioritize our mapping. So, you know, some blue listed species have not been mapped. And then it's really important to know where they potentially may be found, even if we don't have a, a location um, that we've mapped. Okay, great. Um, I see Luna, Luna Bell is holding her hand up, but I have a few other questions. Luna Bell, if you don't mind putting your questions in the chat, that way we can work through them. That would be much appreciated. Okay, from Amy, um, does the CDC IMAP data feed into the CRD Atlas? Do you know if that happens? I have not checked on that in a long time, but I know that it, it did. Um, I haven't checked CRD Atlas in a while, but we have the, there's a couple of things. I, some people, some applications re-report uh, our data out by getting data cuts from us or by downloading the data regularly from the, G the BC data warehouse and then, and then displaying it in their own applications, which is, which is fair, which is great. We just want to make sure it's been updated. But um, it's very possible that CRD uses our web map services, which actually allows them to link directly to the data from the, the geographic warehouse and feed it live through theirs. So um, I don't know the answer to whether they're doing that right now, but um, I know they have in the past, so yeah. Um. I have uh, from Douglas. Oh, no, uh, from Louise. Let's see. Louise Tremblay, do you uh, have a question still? Uh, Corlin, you can unmute Louise if she has a question. If not, we'll move over to Luna Bell's question. OK. Luna Bell, you're unmuted if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Oh, thank you. Hi, Katrina. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. First of all, for a species at risk that's on a private property, uh, in order to map it, we need the consent um, from everybody that owns that property. Is that right? That's correct. So before the BC government can accept data, we need to know, I mean, we need assurance basically that it's been legally collected, which means no trespass has occurred. Um, and that if it required access to private land, that you have permission of the landowner to submit the data to us. And then if that's the case for, we need to know how we can use it. So can we release the details publicly or are they requested to be secured? We certainly don't encourage securing. It really adds a lot of work to our workload, but um, certainly we can secure it um, as long as we can manage it within our system. Um, manage that release uh, when we deem it necessary. We struggle with data sets that are requested to be secured um, because it we want the value of that data to be there for us to use. So we have to weigh kind of the management it requires to, or sorry, the time and resources to manage secure data versus um, the value of that data. Uh, but yes, you're correct. We do need assurance. We don't need writing, but we need assurance that that landowner knows it's being submitted. Right, okay. And and um, so if there's like multiple landowners on one land, we need that assurance from everybody on that land basically. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I've really run into this, but I think you're probably correct unless, 
unless you're, yeah. I mean, we put that onus on the data submitter. So if, if you were comfortable yeah, yeah. that everyone was in agreement, that's all we need to know. So um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think the onus is on the, the submitter to ensure that they've got everything uh, that they need to submit. Okay. We don't ask for the a sign off unless it's requested to be secured. And then we have a bit of uh, a form to make sure we're gonna manage it properly. Okay, great. And I just had two quick other questions. Um, when a species at risk is on like a large area, like say the property that I'm talking about, for example, is 140 acres and it's like on that property. Um, and I have like, you know, I have specific data points from everywhere on that property. Um, are we submitting, you know, uh, if there's an area where um, we can make note of that, that it's been seen, you know, all over this area. And um, part of that question as well is uh, historical observations. You were saying that you guys are interested in historical observations. So for a species at risk, say that has been seen in an area like for the last four years, um, consistently every year, and we have, you know, picture proof from every year during the months that it's there. Uh, you guys have, um, we, we can submit that as well with our data. Yeah, I think that's all important information. I think we can't have too much uh, context to an observation. So I think that is valuable to know. Um, and, you know, if it's found throughout a whole property, I I think the, the best data we can have is still all of the points if that's how you've collected it. Um, mm -hmm. If you've interpreted that by also kind of like, a, like collecting a polygon or something, that can also be submitted. That's also useful. But um, we'd love to see, I think, all of the uh, the points that have been collected, and then and then we have the most information to make our own, um, you know, interpretations of it as well in conversation mm -hmm. with you if that's most appropriate. Yeah, and I would Great. say that um, it's always worth like even though we we encourage and route data through the uh, the data portal I was showing, the submission portal. Um, conversations with our CDC biologists are also useful and welcomed as well. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, Katrina, we have about just less than 15 minutes. Do you wanna go ahead and get started in your demo? There's other questions that go into quite detail and I think those okay. might be better answered uh, directly through your email. Um, sure. So let's, uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Okay. And I will Let's stop sharing. And, okay, and I will say that what I'm gonna do is um, start with Explorer. And I, you know, I guess do it quite, well, I don't wanna do it too quickly. I'll let, lose you, but I, I know everyone has not a lot of time to spare, but I'm happy to also stay a bit later if people uh, want to ask more questions about the, the demos. So I will just leave it at that. So here we are, this is Species and Ecosystems Explorer. And I wasn't gonna do data catalog, but I'm gonna skip that uh, for now. Can you so, go full screen, yeah. Katrina, just to make that a little bit bigger? Oh, um, what have I done? That, that is that's, as full as it gets, but I can okay. um, zoom in maybe. Does that help? That's better, yeah, that's okay. better. Okay, so what I'm going to do is kind of run through the options, um, but also build a search as we go. So you can see, um, you know, you can get to some FAQs, the home page that will give you a bit of background information about the tool. These are quick search buttons. These, if you click one of these, you're going to get responses for the whole province. Uh, so if you, this was a, is a popular search, you want the red and blue, so species at risk, and then anything species at risk act federally designated, so under SARA. So that's a popular uh, search. <clears throat> you can search by an individual species or ecological community name. And as you start typing, it will um, you know, filter down to what you might be interested in. I'm not going to do that right now though, um, but that's an option if you're just interested in one element. So this is where we can kind of build a bit of a search. Uh, if we search by group, and expand these, you can see um, if we expand invertebrates, this is where I was like, oh yeah, we do have the fleas. I didn't know that. Um, I think there's 10 in the province maybe. Um, 
in plants. You can search by these various uh, categories. I am going to pick plants as my, uh, my criteria, but you'll see ecological communities, you have different realms and classes as well. So let's add or let's refine our search by conservation status or legal designation. Um, so I like to choose red and blue. And I think that if you've got, you know, you're interested in a particular area and those that are at risk, this is probably your best bet. Red and blue, we don't need to do status because we've already kind of simplified it with our BC list. Um, and I often will jump down to legal designation, but certainly COSIWIC status is a national um, status of interest to people. And I just like to pick all of them. So now we've got plants that are red and blue or legally designated in our, in our search. So search by area, um, I'm going to, you can draw an area of interest or you can upload a shapefile or KML to do your search. I'm going to jump to local trust areas. <clears throat> and this will narrow our search just to the ranges um, within, uh, here we've got the local trust showing up but we could draw on that map if we wanted. I'm gonna pick executive islands, which I, I think is the term for all of them. I'm not pretty sure, yeah, I think. <laughs> Maybe you, this is worth- You have to click all of them, so if you- You do, well thank yeah. you for teaching me because I didn't realize it. Maybe that's why my search results are strange. Okay. <laughs> um, and then you can add other search options by biogeoclimatic unit or whether it's native or endemic. The fact that we've chosen species at risk though means that they're native um, or ha and habitat type. These are really useful, uh, but they are not complete. So there are some species group where this information hasn't been filled out. So if you use habitat type, I definitely recommend that you um, use that, but then do another search without this specified so that you can get a more complete result. So based on that, I'll do the search and we have 85 records. Yeah, see my, uh, my results were different, weren't they? Um, so this is a results page. Uh, right here, we were only showing 10. We can change that if we choose. We can turn on and off some, um, you know, some fields if we don't wanna see them, change the sort order. Um, let's look at, uh, let's see, we'll go across the top here. So yellow sam verbena is S3. If we are not sure what S3 means, we can click on that and see its special concern. Um, blue listed, uh, we can uh, have links to Sarah. We can see that this tall bug vein is under the Forest and Range Practices Act. We can keep going across and see that we have mapped known locations of these um, species and communities. Right here, we can see that for deltoid balsam root, there are some locations that are secured. I know this isn't a species susceptible to harm, so I'm confident that these are proprietary based on private land ownership. So I'll just go to a map location. And so this is showing that, see, this is where we start going, hmm, is the range really there? Um, and uh, people here probably know the answer better than I do. But if we click on each of these locations, uh, you get a, um, like a summary of that location, or you can click here and get the same summary at a different location. If we zoom in, we can actually switch to polygons and see the element occurrences in that more detail there. And go back to results. So what that does highlight though, is that this is coming up in your potential results. It doesn't mean there's a map location there. So that's kind of the difference between potential and mapped. Um, if we go to reports, we can, let's see, we'll go to some like onion, how about? So in the reports, this is the BC species summary. It tells you kind of the biology about that species, um, some information about where it occurs. That's a pretty bare bones one there. Um, <clears throat> you know what, I'm going to go back and choose one that uh, has a bit more information. So the BC Conservation Status Report is where you'll find information about why it's been given that conservation status rank. So all that information that goes into that ranking process is found there. Same map and known locations, and then we have links to other interesting things like recovery and management plans, etc. 
so sorry. How did you get to that page? Okay, so if you've got your results, it's under reports, or you can click on the scientific name. Either way, Perfect. it will take you to all this. Now, the other thing you can do from the results page is export those results. Um, you can print, I think that just goes to like, you know, print a PDF, but export results does have confusion around it, which is why I'm again, definitely gonna show this and will be improved in our next iteration of this. This here, export search results, exports, so it provides you a, a table of what you see on the screen here, um, although all 85 records, uh, nothing more. If you export the summary data, that gives you a lot more information that people uh, have found are missing from the results uh, export. So uh, this will tell you which um, uh, which municipalities it occurs in, like in a field. It has a lot more information that you'll find in those reports. The conservation status export is the information again that you saw in the conservation status report. Um, that tells you why it's given a particular rank. So basically this is one export, this is one export, and then um, there's that over, that very summary one, which is this. It's not intuitive. I know this because I get asked that all the time. Um, other important things to point out is the search criteria. So if you are going like, this doesn't make sense, what are these results I'm seeing? Uh, reach out to us and provide us with this. This can help you determine what you've got results for, and it can help us find any um, errors or mistakes. So we love to hear from people. Um, citation. And uh, that is, oh, the only other thing I need to show here is if you go to those map locations, um, clicking on a occurrence and opening the full record bumps you out into CDC IMAP, where it will zoom you into the actual occurrence location. Then you can start playing an IMAP if you want. but. I tend not to go at it from that uh, workflow. Are there any questions from Explorer? That's quick, I know. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. I know we only have four minutes, so I'm, my apologies. I don't think we have any direct questions for Explorer. So yeah, carry on. No, so we'll go on. Okay. So CDC IMAP, this is a splash page. This is me speaking in a YouTube video. I did have one thumbs down on that video. I see it has since been taken off. So I'm happy there's like four thumbs up instead <laughs> over the last five years. Um, so CDC IMAP, <clears throat> we've got, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do in the interest of time is take you to like the fastest way you can get what you need from your area of interest. Um, and hopefully that will be useful to you. So if we click on layers, uh, the CDC layers are all found under the fish, wildlife, and plant species. And I'm going to just open that up a bit. Um, we've got our publicly available, extirpated, and mass secured. Uh, and we'll just go along the top here, add data BC layers. Ones I like to highlight that you can add into view are the WSI, which is the wildlife species inventory layers. Uh, and I'll let you play with that, but I'll just add in the survey observations. The other one I like to bring to people's attention is the federal, the critical habitat for federally listed species is another one that people are really interested in. So I'll just add those two in. Um, I'll go along, upload data. You can upload a shapefile or KML of your area of interest. And the cool thing is you can do that here and you can do that in Explore and get your potential and your known occurrences. I'm gonna go to markup. You can draw on the map. This is where you could draw your area of interest and then export that as a shape file, that markup as a shape file, and then use it in the future and in Explorer. What I'm going to do though is concentrate here on the find tools because that helps you get the information you need. Um, hey, Katrina, sorry, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Can you yeah. zoom in again? Because oh, the I'm print, sorry, yeah. that's okay, that would be very helpful. Thanks, Amy, um, for bringing that up. Better? Better? Okay. Better, okay. still, st still small, but better. Let's go 110. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, also, you know what? Well, because we are starting to have people um, close out, Katrina, yeah. what I'm going to do um, just momentarily is just um, do my last kind of slide so that Please I can say do. goodbye and thank yes. you. I will and stop then, 
Yeah, that would be great. And then um, let me just make sure here. Um, yeah, then we can carry on after that. But um, I just want to remind folks that we have um, uh, we have one more uh, webinar left, but also I just want to take the time to thank you for attending. If you are going to stay with us, fantastic. If not, um, uh, we may potentially have a recording of this session. I'll let you know via email. Um, we do have one more speaker series, as I mentioned, our last one. Maya Modeste from Stakai uh, Learning Center will be, or sorry, Learning Society, will be sharing with us about the cultural significance of Gary Oak and associated ecosystems in the Quetzan Mustumuk, uh, which I'm probably not saying correctly, uh, the Cowichan peoples. So don't forget to register for that if you're interested. And um, reminder that when you close out, um, you will have a survey pop up. And please take a moment to uh, complete that survey. It won't take long at all. We'd really appreciate it. Um, gives us an idea on how we can improve. Um, like showing slides, for example, in the beginning. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna stop my share. And thank you if we uh, are having anyone leave. I appreciate for you coming. Okay. The only thing I'm going to add is I know that Wendy has my government email address up, but the very best way to make sure your questions are always answered and never fall through the cracks of my email is to send to cdcdata at gov.bc.ca. And I wonder if that can be put in the chat. Um, every single email is responded to that comes there. When it comes to me, I try my very best, but I have all sorts of other things that sometimes move it down. So please do. Um, okay. And yeah, so I'll, I'll continue on this. I won't be offended if we end up with two at the end, but I'm just gonna speak through like you're all, you're all here. <laughs> oh, we still have 60 people. You're doing just fine. Okay. And we'll share. Okay, so. Uh, here we are, we've added two more layers. Um, I am going to, let's zoom into Denman, Denman Island. And if I could take, that would be helpful. Okay, so let's pick our search results. I'm gonna come out of there a bit. You'll build up windows along the left-hand side here um, that you can close when you've, your use of them is done. This looks really awfully messy right now. Um, so I'm gonna turn off a couple of layers that I know are making it especially messy and I'll, I can still talk about that. So what we can see here is we have over Denman a, um, a masked uh, location. Often I will just turn off, you know, the, the publicly available layer and just go, okay, clearly I've got mass data here. I need to reach out to CBC data um, and find out if I need to know anything more about that. Then you can turn that off. But we'll turn on the two public layers. Uh, one of the things that I always uh, recommend not doing <laughs> is using the point tool, like the, the one to find out what's in your area of interest getting it right in the right location or if you're just wanting to know what that one occurrence is and using a point doesn't always you might not just be right in the right spot so i tend to hesitate to use this and i like to use these three to get the quickest results or four i should say now let's say we're using the rectangle to see what's in our area um if you often this is overlooked identifiable layers is is telling the system what you're interested in knowing is in the area so if you check click on this if you've got like world topple map citations on it's going to return results for that my guess is you don't you're not interested in that so and you may have other base map and boundaries that aren't of interest for your particular query so i tend to clear it all and then just choose the ones I am interested in. So let's say I'm just interested in the two CDC layers at this time. So now uh, if I'm, let's just say I'm doing some project here, but I know that it's important to consider what else is mapped and known in the area. I would tend to, I would tend to buffer my, my query by you know, a couple of kilometers, depending on what kind of project you're, you're undergoing. Um, and then we can, let's see, continue. 
I'll just draw, let's say we're looking at this little lake here. And um, we can see that there's not too much like in this direct area. Did I, is that a two kilometer buffer? I have a hard time imagining that, but let's, let's get- Two meters. Did I do two meters? Thank you. <laughs> like, that doesn't look right. Okay, well, we can print here. I'll do this just to be faster. Kilometers, do that again. There, thanks for that. Um, so we have four results here. What can we do with these results? Um, great blue heron, we can link over to Explorer that will do a search for us and show us the, those results that we saw in Explorer. We can run a CDC report, which has the details about that particular element occurrence, and you can export that to PDF. If we click on one of these records, we can get more information just about that one occurrence record. So there's occurrence data, um, things like that. I'm gonna close that individual one. One thing that not everyone realizes is you can uh, click on this stacked panel action menu and view this information in, the, in a table. So it allows you to see the information a little, you know, in a perhaps easier way. If we had multiple um, layers we were querying, they would all kind of come up as tabs along here. From here, you can export to Excel um, or to comma separated value. I personally, I like the list of you. Uh, so I'm gonna go back here. Um, one thing that you can do is also export to shapefile. And if you had results from, again, three or four different layers, they all will get exported into separate shape files that you can use by reloading back into an IMAP application, or you can actually load it into Google Earth, which I know a lot of people like to do. So in Google Earth, you can add a shape file um, and even convert it to KML there. So that's really useful for people. Um, if you're interested in just wanting to know about one particular species or ecological community, we can do a quick select. And so this allows us with all of this language here, basically just to select for one particular species and it will provide you all the element occurrences we have in the province for that. I will we'll just pick that first one there. Um, now, what will be interesting you can see like you actually can't even see where these are and that's because they're probably fine polygons, which is why in Explorer we provide that overview map with, with points that you can actually see them at that scale. Of interest, EcoAtlas, when you select by species or ecological community, will return results for the CDC data, as well as the wildlife species inventory data, as well as the critical habitat data, so you'll have all of those results, which is going to be, I think, really useful for people. Um, these spatial queries, or this spatial query does very, does pretty much the same thing that these four tools do, but in a kind of hand-holding way. So um, I'm going to show you if we had uploaded um, a shape file or a KML that you <clears throat> that you already have generated for your area, for your project or area of interest. I'll just show you what you can do with that. So we'll just upload that. Close that. So I had already created this one for, you know, a little blob around a couple of islands. Um, if you go uh, to the spatial query, <clears throat> this walks you through a little bit. It makes you, click on the things you're interested in getting results for. Um, next. And then you have some options here. You can get results for the current extent of the map or the uploaded layer. And we just uploaded that one, so we can do that. Selected features is if you had, say, selected a municipality polygon and you wanted to know what was in there, or you can draw on the map. And I'll just choose uploaded layer. It's that one that I called polygon uniquely and um, <clears throat> it will give us results that way. It takes some time, it's going through the different layers, so you do have to have a bit of patience to get that. Uh, so there's 48 in that area. <clears throat> I will just put on the wildlife WSI data. While it's checking away, I'm gonna close some of these because it does start building up these windows that you're kind of done with. We'll zoom in there and show you the, um, 
the survey data, as well as the critical habitat data, um, which is a federal data set, but we do serve it through the provincial systems. And while that's chugging away, oh, there we go. So you'll see that there are a lot more points and observations than element occurrences, which makes sense. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I think that I've probably covered most of the things I wanted to. If there are any, please let me know. Okay. Um well, Amy has mentioned, because I agree with this, the demos are really useful. And I think there's quite a few of us that would benefit from uh, in-person training for these platforms. Is that something you've done in the past? I know you and I have talked recently about an idea of a workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am, I am always available to help walk people through this. And if I um, you know, if I know that there's a group of people that, that want demos, absolutely. I, I like to take the time to get have people understand them. <clears throat> so I'm happy to do that um, anytime, really. And I do that regularly. Uh, so yeah, for sure. Okay. Fantastic. Um, if I can get you to stop share, we'll just go ahead and wrap up for today. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going to have to close out the session. And um, let me just do this and um, just take a moment if you'd like to, uh, I guess we have to unmute everybody, but just show your hands and appreciation to Katrina for this amazing uh, presentation and demonstration. And it's really helpful. The more we learn about this, uh, the more that our region can be represented for species and ecosystems at risk and, and, and someday soon the cultural species of significance as well. Um, Thank you very much for attending and uh, thanks to Corlin for her support during the session and uh, I hope everybody uh, has a really great day. Thanks again. Thanks everybody.